It's Thursday again, tell everybody to lock in Grab some popcorn, a drink, and go and throw your AirPods in It's a one-hour show, constantly speaking facts Bulletproof stats are always shooting from Matt And when it comes to Kyle, you getting numbers and style Jake is gonna educate you, he has that knowledge on fire Player, step your game up, don't be sluggish or lazy Or Jimmy J might hit you with a shaky baby Catch him on YouTube or any podcast platform Breaking all the news down like Shaq does the backboards No hot takes, this is where the hottest debate's at Now kick your feet up, cause it's time for straight facts What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to Straight Facts, a sports show that educates and entertains. It's your boy, Jimmy J. I'm back. Took a little week off, but my guys held it down for me, as always. Jake Galley and Stabat Robinson. Get up, excuse me. The voice is a little raspy, and I kind of don't know why. I just yeah. like, which is It's concerning. that time of year. It's that time of year, that's, dude. That's true. A lot of people get their allergies in the springtime. My worst allergies come in the fall from the from the change of weather from really hot to, to cool is when I start to get allergies. So maybe it's that, but I don't know. I just woke up with a scratchy throat. It's bad. I have hoops mania this weekend for Nova. So like this, this guy get cleared up. I'm like telling my body, like, you got to do something about this, man. It's some you airborne. Be, you'll be set. You'll be all right. A, a Hall's fruit breezer or yeah. two. We'd be good to go. <laughs> yeah. We'd be good to go. Stat Matt. Rolled in with a 3-0 and squad. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Everything's He's... going my way. Only thing that I'm not thinking about the Phillies. I don't let I don't let that negative energy kind of, cloud kind me. Kind of pissed off that you it's, even brought them up. To be it's honest. good. It's good. It, like getting a little, but thankfully, Eagles. It's Eagles zone. The Sixers have the good preseason vibes they have every year. I'm loving. So you got you got just like absurd propaganda about Harden being back at MVP level that I'm like kind of buying. So just because I'm a homer. Welcome but, back. But like I'm feeling good. No, you should buy it. Um quick the th- quick little tidbit on James Harden. Y'all know that he didn't lose hundred pounds, right? Yeah. You know I that know it's that. like physically impossible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because because some people were eating it up and I'm just like, hey, let's just do quick math here. Like it's physically impossible for him to lose hundred pounds. He'd be ill. I'd be very <laughs> worried about James Harden. If you lost 100 pounds. So I had to make sure that your homer didn't take too much, like too much of control when you were eating that up. But no, it's more like we, he's in great shape, was what he meant. But I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. We will focus on what's going on right now, and that is the NFL. And there's a bunch of teams that we really got to take a look at because there are teams who are starting off red hot, maybe to some people's surprise, some people's non surprise. There are teams who are struggling. To some people's surprise, not to some people's surprise. So we got to see if these teams' records are an indication of how good these teams are, or if they're misleading or not. And a nod to Dennis Green with the title of this segment: We're calling them. They are who we thought they were. R.I.P. to the legend Dennis Green. The first team we're going to start with are the three and zero Miami Dolphins. And for a lot of people, and like I said, to not some people's surprise, Jake would be one of those people who are not surprised. Yes, sir. To a, Tua has emerged. It actually hasn't even been just the start of this season. Dating back to last year, in the last 10 starts that Tua has had with the Dolphins, the Dolphins are 9-1 and one in those games. And then this year, lighting the world on fire, fourth in completion percentage, 71%. That's not surprising to anyone. Like, he was – that was his hallmark in college is he was praised for how accurate he was. He could put the ball where it needs to be. What's surprising to me – is second in pass yards, 925, and second in QB rating, 117.8. So he's not just, you know, the accuracy isn't the only thing that's on display. It's the full arsenal that he's doing with the Dolphins. And, Jake, you've been on it since day one that you knew people's perception of two was going to change. But it's like now it's it's getting ridiculous. Now it's, you know, he's taking down really good teams in the AFC. Yeah, this was... Obviously, I'm really high on two. We talked about it last week a little bit. Um, this is pretty far beyond expectation, even for me. Uh, I thought he would have a good year and the Dolphins would be a punchy team. Um, I continued to think that even after they went blow for blow with the Ravens. I mean, that's a great game, but they're letting up almost 40 points. Like, mm-hmm. it, you, you traditionally, unless you're Patrick Mahomes, you're not winning like that um consistently so to see them come out and 
play a relatively low scoring game. I mean, they ended up beating uh, Buffalo only by two because of the safety off of Trent Sheffield's cheeks, as Tyreek would say. Uh, crazy. But like, man, hats off to the Dolphins uh, because everything is trending their way, especially after an offseason where they were antagonized, let's say, by Twitter a whole lot. Uh, the Tom Brady thing that with their owner broke. That was a bad look on Tua. The maybe um, duck of a pass, maybe not, that Tua threw to Tyreek. That you, got mean, you mean, put on social, you mean media. His own social media team trolling him? That's what that was. A lot Holy of stuff expression. was going against the Dolphins heading into the year. And I got to say, I am stunned even being high on them, seeing them 3-0 and so far. But I, I think they're for real. I think they could definitely be a top, you know, two, three seed but, in the AFC. So, so then, yes, you think that 3-0 and record is indicative of how good they are. This isn't performing. Because you, cause you started off by saying performing above expectations. So, I, to me, that's different. Like to me, performing above expectations and being a real three and O team are two sides of the argument. So preseason expectations as well. I mean, obviously me, from here on out, I mean, they just beat Buffalo. Like you're, you're no longer the sneaky underdog team. You just, that's a statement win. In I week watched three. a lot. I watched the highlights of that. Cause I looked at the box score and it didn't make sense to me. The Buffalo Miami game. Just look at the UI. And I watched, like, I found a condensed version of the game, and I watched all of it, and I came away more confident that Buffalo is still better than Miami. Like, oh, it's great that Miami won. They needed to win. They're probably not going to win in Buffalo in December for, like, tiebreaker purposes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really important they won. But I, I think we're that. getting clouded by the fact that 3-0 and is there's only two teams that are 3-0 and right now. I'll, usually there's a lot more. Usually there's a team that's probably going to start like 7-0, and 6-0. and Like 3-0, you can be a bad team in a season and go 3-0 and in the beginning. The Panthers did it last year. The Dolphins are not that. The Dolphins are a very good up-and-coming team. I still, in my like rankings in my head, like Buffalo, I still rate higher than them. But Me too. It's just... Like, if you look at DVOA, they're 11th. It's second in offense, 24th in defense. I think their defense will get better. I think their offense will get worse, mostly because defense people are going to – they put the league on notice, and people are going to adjust to them, and it's up to McDaniel and Tua to adjust back. But this Waddle and Tyreek Hill and Tua combination is working better than anyone could have hoped. Uh just really quick, it is worth noting that those Panthers went three and zero against the Jets, the Texans, and the Saints, versus yep. the three and zero against the Bill Belichick led Patriots. Even though they may yep. not be the best team, playoffs uh, the, last year. The Baltimore Ravens. Uh, we'll get to them, and uh, last week with the Bills. So, hey, I, I'm I'm done in trying to tamper expectations with the- Miami because they've looked awesome. That that's a that's a for real team. And like what is what what tells me that they're for real, even this early in the season, and I do hear your argument, Matt, because sometimes you don't want to jump too like too early at three and oh. Like the Panthers weren't the only team to start three and oh last year who fell off a cliff. Like look at the Cardinals went ten and one or something like that and fell off a cliff. So, you know, we don't want to overreact to a hot start. But Jake talked about the teams that they beat, the caliber of teams that they're beating, and they're winning in different ways. Like it, they're not just, you know, this, the same type of game or the same outcome of game week in and week out that they're winning. You, you take them to a shootout against the Baltimore Ravens where they're going to have to go blow to blow, blow for blow with Lamar Jackson and contend with him. Or you can put them in a dog fight with last year's division winner in the Buffalo bills, a great team on both sides of the ball. And they can come out with a victory scraping that way too. So it reminds me similarly of the 49ers, not last year in their NFC Championship run, but in their Super Bowl year when they were this really good team to start, but they were winning all these kinds of games. Like they were they were winning ugly games in the mud. They were winning shootout games against the Ravens too, right? So they were they were winning all these games in these different types of ways. And that to me is what a good team does. Like, put them in any kind of situation against any team. We're going to figure out a way to win no matter how ugly the game is or how, how, how high scoring the game is, if our defense has to win it or if our offense has to win it. That's a game. But 
I, that's that's what's impressing me about them. To me, it's, uh, it's, I, I view them as a, they're in that mix of teams. And they're, that's where they are. Like, I don't see them above like the rest of the field in the AFC, even if I take the Bills out. And like I still think the Ravens would give them a great game in a playoff game. Like a lot of teams and the uh, Chiefs obviously I like they're they're in the mix of like the four really good teams in the AFC and I would probably put them in near the bottom of that mix. But they are in the mix. They, they haven't leapfrogged Buffalo to me either. To me, that was more of a statement game of, of the Dolphins combined with the Bills already being in week 18 and in the divisional round and then the AFC championship game in their head. Like forgetting that they got to stack 17 weeks in order to get there. Like after how they bounce back after this will determine how good the bills are going to be. But all the dolphins did was, was really announce their presence to me. It wasn't a dethroning of the bills. They're not better than the bills, but, but they're not, they're a good team. Yeah. Like, I agree. Are a, a, a contending team. Absolutely. Led, led by Tua, man. Like you got to give, like that's what you got to do is really give two of the shine. Uh, and I found this stat fascinating because I think it encapsulates kind of the, the growth that we're seeing from Tua pretty well. Uh, so despite being pressured the ninth most, ninth highest rate, uh, just about 27.4% of his dropbacks, Tua has scrambled zero times when being pressured, when being blitzed. Um, he also has the fourth most yards passing. So to me, what that what I take from that is that when being pressured, he can identify where that um, rusher is coming from if they are sending someone extra, hitting his hot routes. And then as we talked about in the beginning of the year, like it really, it, it can really be as easy as identify where the blitzer is coming, hit Tyreek in stride, and we, we, we hit high fives as we put six on the board. That could be mm-hmm. life for Tua, and it probably will be for um, most of the games this year. I mean, very impressive. And we'll see, because like Matt said, now the target's probably more so on their back than being the underdog. Well, of all the things that Tua had coming out of college, the accuracy was what it pointed out, and it was the smarts. Like, he was the most cerebral quarterback in his draft class. Saban raved about how smart he was at the quarterback position. And it don't even take a Alabama graduate to realize that if someone's coming on a blitz, that's one less person they have in the secondary. So wherever that blitzer is coming from, like I have so many weapons on the outside, throw it to where that blitzer is coming from. Like if he's coming from the left side, there's one less person over there that's guarding Jalen Waddle. So Jalen here, here's the ball, go make something happen. If it's from the right side, Tyreek, same thing. If it's in a flat where he most hurt, same thing. Like that's, that's what he's so good at doing is not, doing too much when that blitzer comes, not trying to scramble and make a home run play. Like make the easy play, let these boys do the, do the thing. And then when you get time to go down the field, go down the field. But like the, Miami's also second in yards per play at 6.4. So they're getting these chunk plays down the field. Now great. It, they got yak warriors over there. So it's a lot of it. It probably is run after the catch, but the big explosive plays, we've seen a couple of them where two has put the ball 50 60 yards downfield and that's not something i expected to see i expected to see especially early in the season to get the ball to your weapons and let them go make plays in space what i did not expect to see is the amount of times that Tua gets the ball to tyreek beyond the defense like over past the defense to both of them i didn't like maybe they're taking advantage of safeties creeping up right now thinking the ball's going underneath for the run after the catch but like, I'm seeing Toa, Tua throw that thing, you know, 40, 50 yards in the air, and it'd be completed. I didn't expect to see that. Yeah, and when you have, you know, if it's Tyreek going deep and Waddle coming across the field and you're a safety, it's like, okay, which guy are you going with? Which guy do you want to shade towards? It's just, it, it, it's a different game for our guy, Tua T. And I'm happy to see him succeed. Him, him and his former college teammate, both succeeding at a, at a high Level. Yeah, what a, what a seamless transition, I was about to say, because there's another guy I'm sure you're happy to have. Look at the smile Matt has on his face. <laughs> I haven't even introduced the team yet, and Matt is literally ear-to-ear smiling like a kid on Christmas morning. But 
the other three and O team in the NFL, the Eagles, a, a complete team effort is what you guys are showing. Number one in total offense, number fit or defense is fifth in yards allowed. So coming up on both sides of the ball, but just like with Miami's case, the, the person you got to highlight on your team is Jalen Hurts and what he's being able to do. People are putting Jalen Hurts in the MVP conversation through three games, putting you guys number one in the NFL through three games. So stop. You want to talk about stuff is going really well. Stuff is going really well in Philly, man. And, and Monday night was a debacle. Was a debacle. I don't I don't want to get too excited, but I think it's a little too late. But I'm getting <laughs> There, there's some serious 2017 vibes coming from this team, and it's and it's just lovely to see the camaraderie. The team loves each other. The young quarterback having his breakout season, um, and AJ Brown. I know, like Devontae Smith had the better game or more yards, but AJ Brown is so good. Just, I he's the best receiver the Eagles have had since To. And it's such a luxury because even when Hertz doesn't throw the perfect pass, he's still going to get it. And when it's a quarterback that's not like a top tier quarterback, it's so tough to get those big plays. But when you have an AJ Brown, he can he can do the little correction and still turn it into a huge play, which just changes games. Yeah, I um, I don't know if. I told you guys this. I went to the game, uh, was there with the 36 buses of Eagles fans that went down. I, my optimism is really through the roof. And this, and that's coming from someone who already is like probably the unrealistic optimist. If this team stays healthy, they're going to be the number one seed in the NFC. Um, you can't re- when when they're, rotation of defensive linemen is churning like you're always going to have someone fresh on the line uh it, just on the defensive side of the ball you have two of the top five um cornerbacks in terms of target epa so um darius slay with minus 13.3 expected points added and james bradbury fourth on this list with uh 10.7 or minus 10.7 it's really such kinda, a good pickup it's, like he was such a good pickup. It is allowed Jalen Hurts, I think, to A, succeed without being perfect, and then B, on top of that, like it takes a little bit of pressure, pressure off of Jalen Hurts when he can open things up. He can not score for, you know, in the, in the fourth quarter, and that's okay. You still win a game. You still win games. If the Eagles didn't have now, a good defense. For now, I'm glad you got there before I did. I'm glad that's. I'm glad you got there before, because you know that's the road I was going down. For now, hey, we got a top five score, defense. We got a top five defense. Twenty four, twenty four points is good. No, 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 no. You know that. Get down to the nitty gritty. Get into playoff mode. Get into games that matter. One, not scoring in the fourth quarter is isn't good enough. And two, twenty four points isn't good enough either. Both those things are not good enough. So yes, that's good now. Against the Lions, Vikings, Bears, oh my. That's we good now. against the Lions. <laughs> Wasn't the Bears, but that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. You know, like, 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 that's good for now. But you know in your heart, Jake, that both those things aren't good enough. Yeah, that but both those things got to be corrected. I and they probably will. Yeah, right. They it's, probably will, but it's not good enough. It's not. I think it's an anomaly, and they'll pick it up. Uh, one, one thing that's been really encouraging and Matt and I talked about it last week, and we saw it again a little bit this week, is Hertz's ability to process his reads and like move in the pocket, but also still maintain eyes downfield, which had not been the case uh, prior. That like, you know, once the first or second read isn't there, he's using his legs to get as many yards as he can. Um, now we see him kind of targeting downfield uh, with more frequency. And Devontae Smith blew up for a massive game, eight catches, 170 yards, a touchdown. Um, A.J. Brown, five catches, 85 yards, a touchdown. This is the Eagles offense that we've always dreamed of. Um, And I think just to cap it off, like the proof in the pudding sort of stat, 38 RPOs uh, the Eagles have ran this year. Hertz has thrown 30 of them. So he's only – it's disproportionate to the pass, and it's working. 
So I think he's reading the defense well. And man, he he looks like he could be all pro. I don't know. I it's it's insane. My my big worry as an Eagles fan is last year the Achilles heel was how we played against really good quarterbacks. They tore us apart. This year we played Jared Goff, primetime Kirk Cousins, and Carson mm-hmm. Wentz. And and if you look at the rest of our schedule, the good news, we don't play that many established great quarterbacks the rest of the season. It's like Aaron Rodgers and that's it. It's for like well, D- Dak is like the tier below, but like like but next week Trevor Lawrence might be having a breakout season. Um, so that'll be interesting. But until I see our biggest flaw from last year be uh, kind of dealt with, I right, can't, right. Can, I can't consider them. Uh, I can't like look at them higher than I look at like a Buccaneers or a Rams or a Packers. And why I think that's like really just objectively fair is that kind of ties into your point too, Jake, about the defense being top tier because that's what's going to test a, a good defense. Like, yes, your defense has been good, but they may a quarterback who's really put the pressure on a def- on your defense from a overall standpoint of what he brings to the table, what he can do. I mean, I guess the court, like, you're right, the quarterback hasn't been premier, but you look around at those teams, the Lions have scored a ton of, ton of points. Granted, granted, they scored a ton of points against us, too, but they right. have scored, they, they're an offense that produces the Vikings the week before they came into that Monday night. Uh, Justin Jefferson was going crazy. I think they beat the Packers, so they were highly regarded. And Carson was was one of the league leaders in passing yards last until going into last week. Um, and you know, for what it's worth, he he really did look like old Carson. It was I was getting flashbacks. Oh, it was, it was, he was, it was, he was holding on to the ball. It was bad. This year, Carson and Jameis have both showed their old teams just exactly what they look like when they were on those old teams. And I think it's, I don't know, it's just kind of football justice for for those games. But <laughs> the, the the last thing I'll put out about the Eagles, these are, these are honest observations that I'm seeing. I'm really not trying to be Eagles hater, but this is, this is from my point of view really what I'm seeing is your defense has to continue to be smoldering dominant and opportunistic has has to continue to give Jalen Hurts extra possessions has to continue to keep the other offense off the field because of right now the kind of inability for your offense to stay hot through the second half stay hot through fourth quarters like you see with the Lions what did that end up being a three-point game at one point yeah. Yeah, the end you know of the game. I mean? Yeah, like like what what like when when the defense stopped dominating the Lions, the gap closed. The gap closed. The gap closed. Now, if your offense learns how to turn that switch on in the second half and continue it, that's fine. But as long as your offense continues to come out the gate really hot, but not continue that in the second half, if your defense doesn't keep being this all world defense, that's where you're not going to beat these teams in the playoffs, you're not going to beat these teams at the end of the regular season. And you're especially not going to beat the good quarterbacks who make a living out of these game winning drives or these really good fourth quarters. Like your, your offense is going to have to be as clutch as your defense at some point. So that's, that's what's to monitor. And again, honest observation, Matt looks like he wants to kill me, but I, no, honest, no, no, honest no, observation. I, I, I agree with like most of what you said there. <laughs> well, we're a I'm, glad it, I'm glad it's got it's gotten your approval. All right, we're going to move on because there's a team who I'm having a little bit of trouble really pinning down. And the record is 2-1, but are they really a, like that good of a football team? And that's the Chicago Bears right now, led by Justin Fields. I mean, uh, they, they've started the season 2-1. Not and really. One. They're, well, that's they're, not the they're, reason they're 2-1. <laughs> <and one. laughs> no, yeah, I, I guess that, yeah. led – is their core by default he's led is default. their quarterback. But <laughs> right, right. But I agree with you. I agree with you. And it's it's part of the reason why I'm having a tough time pinning down this team. Because even like the Bears have to me always been known as a team that's been carried by their defense. Even when they've had bad to mid quarterback play and made the playoffs, Mitchell Trubisky, it's been on the back of a really good defense. Their defense isn't really good this year. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like it's not bad, but it's not really good. But they're two and one, and their wins are like scrappy wins that they've had to like really gut out. They're you know kind of impressive to me. So that's why I'm just having a tough time deciding. Like, are the Chicago Bears really a above five hundred football team like they're 
record indicates after three weeks. No, they stink. <laughs> they're not a good team. They're they're bad. Their offense is set up in a situation where Justin Fields can't succeed, even if he was good. It's like a, almost tragic the situation he's in. They won Week One because they played in a like absolute horrendous rainstorm. Yeah, that was basically downpour. just that's not like good. You earned the win in that climate, but that's not like a thing you can replicate. They got spanked by the Packers because they're much worse. And they barely beat the Texans, who are just bad. They're not horrible, the Texans. They're just bad. And but and the and we might overrate them again going into the next episode because they play another bad two and one team coming up in the Giants. So it's just they're not good. That it's just they've won two games. So <laughs> that's I mean, that's that with the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same camp. It's really scary how bad of a, a, an offensive situation Justin Fields is set up in. Um, I think this is, this is you know, a fate that many young quarterbacks fall into, uh, fall prey to, is, like, if you're, if you don't have talent around you, and if your coach isn't, you know, I guess, I don't, I don't, I don't know how much of a difference the coach makes, but if the coach can't come up with a way to uh, bring you up like get you some easy layups, so to speak. What Doug Peterson, I think, is doing really well for Trevor Lawrence. You're done. How do they not get him any wide receivers? Right. Like, no wide receivers. Paid for it's... Christian Kirk, and like they got like a couple of guys that were decent, and it made the world of difference. And Chicago didn't even try. Yeah, you can't throw the ball, can't run the ball. It is, it's scary. Like they're probably going to win five, six games, but like his career. I would, I'm sure that he wishes he he fell into a little bit better of a landing spot. And, and and each game seems to be a crazy struggle, and that just takes a whole lot out of you and your football team. And and like the cry for Justin Fields' career in the beginning with Matt Nagy is like make it easier on him, make it easier on him with the weapons around him, make it easier on him with the play caller and and what you're asking him to do on the offensive end. And he wasn't doing that. And then when I watched the Bears this season, I'm like, that, that's not, I don't really see it being much easier for Justin Fields. Like, I see him battling on a snap to snap basis. I see him struggling to get in tune with the offense and getting tune with his teammates. Like, everything is a struggle for the Bears. I mean, he's been sacked 18% of his dropbacks through the first three games this year, sacked 10 times on 55 dropbacks. So even as Justin Fields, goes to look down the field and goes to make a play, he's, he's never comfortable. Like, there's never a time where he's comfortable to go make a play. And it's different when you have bad offensive linemen, but you have weapons around you. We talked about Joe Burrow at length. There's a comfortability with knowing that, like, I may not be able to sit in the pocket long enough, but when I throw this thing up in the air, one of these guys I throw it to is going to come down with it. Like, Justin Fields doesn't have that luxury. Like, Darnell Mooney is his most trusted receiver right now. I like Mooney, but you're right. But the, you are right. Most, no, you're right. You're as, right. As the point, as the point, you know what I mean? 5'11", Darnell Mooney. Like, the, you know what I mean? There's nothing like, easy about it. You're right. Yeah, there's you nothing easy about it with, for the Bears. And a young quarterback needs something to be easy. Like you said, layups. Like, something to get them going. Like, there's nothing of that. It's just they <laughs> like, like, and they, and they know it too. Like <laughs> Justin Fields. No, no. Just from an offense, from a passing <laughs> offense situation, Justin Fields has thrown the ball 45 times this year. Yeah, that's three crazy. games. Josh Allen completed 42 <laughs> passes on Sunday. Hmm. Like, like this is, they're, they're afraid to throw the ball and like, they don't have a good, uh, it's, they, they just got, I, the fact that they're two and one is honestly like really surprising based on you just look at their offensive numbers and you're like, how did they get two wins out of here? Like no receivers they, more than four catches <laughs> all on year. The season? On, the, on season, the season? On the season. On the season. That's terrifying. Season. Montgomery leads the team with five catches as a running back. And he's and, out. And, 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 and the leader is a running back. And the leader is a running back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A Cleo Herbert's why because he's 7.3 yards per carry. That's yeah. Best running back ever. You know. Yeah, it's, it's it's bleak times over there in Chicago. So Chicago is the first team on our slate that no, they are they are not who we thought they are, thought they were. Um, 
So it's worth noting that we did think that they stink, which they do, but they're not who their record says they are for sure. So they are who we thought they were, but they're not who their record thought they were. You I mean, you go three and one. This is, this, is, no, this is the first one. I don't care if they go three and one; they're still gonna stink. The like <laughs> the, for three going through. So, Dolphins, Fair. they're better than they thought than I thought they were. The Eagles, they're better than I thought they were. The Bears, they are who I thought they were. They're a bad team. They just happen to be two and one. They'll be forever who we thought they were. There's a team who's not acting as if I thought they were. Mm. I thought they were much. I gotta step aside for this one. I gotta tell. I, yeah. I gotta let you two then do battle here. Three record indicates. I can't believe the Raiders are making me look this bad. I can't believe the Raiders are making me look this bad. <laughs> they are terrible. Their offense is terrible. Like what? It what? It tarnation. Like what is going on? Like it's, yo. Like there's no improvement, Matt. There's I'll, no I'll, improvement. I'll Monty Adams. That's all they do. And Hunter Renfro had two bad fumbles in a row, which I felt bad about. That hurt. Um, that hurt. He, he didn't play last game, game, too. Yeah, um, but it's – what people don't realize is that post – from 2003 to today, so this is the 20th season of this post Fox Raiders Super Bowl era, the Raiders are a worse franchise than the Cleveland Browns. They're yeah. unbelievably horrible. They've never been good – they made two playoff appearances once. One, unfortunately, the, their best season, Derek Carr broke his legs. So they didn't have a shot in the playoffs. And then last year, they made it and they lost a close game in Cincinnati as like a decent team. They're, and they overperformed the analytical expectations based on point differential. And it always comes back to regression. All three of their losses were one possession games. Last year, they won all the one possession games. That's not a sustainable tactic unless you have an all-time great quarterback, which we know Derek Carr is not. It's You have to win games comfortably because you can't bank on winning one-score games in the NFL. Well, but, but, but doesn't Derek Carr, him and Matt Stafford are in that elite class of quarterbacks of all-time game-winning or, or tying fourth quarter drives, am I right? You cannot Derek Carr with Stafford in any situation. You know I mean, all, all I'm doing is saying they're both in that category. I think they're, they're, they're the modern quarterbacks in that I, category. Am I'm I wrong? Gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to peruse the stats a little later. I'm pretty confident it's because he's in that situation a lot. So right, right, might, right. Like which, which is not good. Which is in twenty four comebacks or something. Like he that. he he might put his team in that situation a lot of times. Be up a couple of scores, throw a couple of interceptions. Now you're in a one score game. Like, like I, I I understand the context with that, and it's just like the team that they are are losing to aren't you know aren't teams that are going beating other teams. The Chargers, I'll give them you know division loss. They're supposed to be a good team, but the other every other team that they lost to are is winless. And there are other games in the NFL. And then, Matt, you talked about their unwillingness to be clutch or finish drives at the end of the game. I am just befuddled at the offense that I'm watching. Like, an inability to get Darren Waller going. An inability to get Josh Jacobs going because you're behind and must throw the ball. Inability of Derek Carr to look like that he's in that next level or take that next step up to be solidified top 10 like some people hoped he would be. Like I'm, I'm just really confused at how bad the Raiders are looking right now, and it, nothing looks like it's it's running and being put together. It looks like there's six separate good weapons out on the field instead of one good team or one good offense out in the field. Like it looks just disconnected. They're like almost they never like, ran around together. They're almost like the like the Lakers last year. Like yeah. names My turn that everyone turn. knows. But like no one, but like as a team, which is but these guys set. are young. Those guys at least were old. They had that. They had that <laughs> excuse. These guys are young. Well, look, I so as someone who traded for Darren Waller in uh, a fantasy league, if you were yeah, to right. show me a picture a couple of months ago, reading Darren Waller three catches, twenty two yards, Mac Hollins. Eight yeah. catches, 158 <laughs> yards, and a touchdown. Yeah. I would think, yeah. like, oh, I'm about to wake up in a cold sweat. It's okay. This is just sitting mm-hmm. there. That is shocking to see. Um, and ultimately, like, when you look at this, their last game against Tennessee, which they ended up losing, um, Carr, 44 passing attempts. He was only pressured on five of them. He was sacked once. Like, 
Yeah, it's it's, just bad. it's like, coming it's, it's just down bad to play. Derek Carr's underperformance. So I don't know. I mean, it, Derek Carr is not a quarterback stuff. you can win with in the NFL. He's just not. Oh, I don't man. know why. Like he's gotten this Yo, long. Like, leash. It's it's crazy because I just have to sit here and watch yeah, him the, throw stones at Derek Carr, uh, and it, it's Derek Carr's fault because he's not equipping me with a defense. The it's Derek. Derek Carr's this is fault. Derek Carr's ninth year in the NFL. Like he is a veteran, veteran. Like yeah, you're we vet, know yeah. what he is at this point. And he's in the Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, Jared Goff tier. That's where he is. And the stats back it up. Career-wise, he has a worse passer rating than Kirk Cousins. Mm. Fewer passing yards on more passing attempts. And uh, touchdown-interception ratio, he has uh, slightly less interceptions, but way less touchdowns. Jimmy Garoppolo, it's a little closer because the careers don't really mishmash because the game started as like half for Jimmy G. But Jimmy G has much better stats, um, but he gets hurt a lot more. Cars more durable. Uh, but Jimmy G has four playoff wins. And His team does. Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but, but Jake, but Jake, he didn't Jared, give him away. Jared Goff. Like, like yeah. He didn't get in his team's way. His Jared Goff. Go ahead. Jared, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Jared, Jared Goff, slightly worse passer rating. Um, <sighs> and just like yards per attempt are a little bit better. Uh, completion percentage one percent worse. Um, I I don't go by QB record, so that's a slight you can do to Carr, but I don't do that because I viewed his pitcher record. But I Jared Goff made a Super Bowl, and like he like I think he's better than Goff, Derek Carr. I think he's better than Jimmy G. But like this idea that you can win a Super Bowl or contend with Derek Carr is as real to me as saying you can contend with Kirk Cousins. I just if they I don't have, see it happening. At all time defenses, sure. Like that's the only way you win with those kind of quarterbacks is mm-hmm. all time defenses, which they which they do not have. Their defense is just as infuriating because uh, I'm sorry, I, I paired two of the top five sack getters last year in the league together. What am I what am I what am I getting out of it? What am I what am I getting out of it? What am I doing with it? Here's look, here's the deal. Josh McDaniels is not a winner. He's not a winner outside of New England. He's just not, okay? Like, love the guy. I find you're great as an offensive coordinator under the greatest coach of all time. No, you, yeah. I do not really dislike Josh McDaniels. Uh, he is such a, like he's, he's he's such like a he's punchable like face guy. Yeah, they, I feel like he's a super very punchable face They deserve this 0-3 start for not re-upping uh, Rick Bisakia. I agree. Yeah, like, I agree. I agree with that. I agree that's, with that. That's what you get. It's less get. about it's less about Josh McDaniels. He caught a little stray just now. It's less like about Josh McDaniels than it is about Ray Pasekia. Like it's more about what he did last year with the team. And we don't have to go into like all that he endured and, and what he had to do with the team to get them to the playoffs. But I just think you will reward someone and your team like that with bringing him back. If you have to bring in coordinators and advisors, whatever. But he got the best out of everybody in that locker room. And right now, you're not getting the best out of everybody in that locker room. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen Hunter Renfro fumble. You followed him in college. Yeah, that was man. crazy. How often uh, did you see Hunter Renfro? He was very assured hands, yeah. And he, he fumbled, fumbled with the game on the line twice. Mm-hmm. That's brutal. <laughs> and it was Clemson on Clemson, Clemson on Clemson crime, too, with the second one, because it was Isaiah Simmons, their teammates together. Yeah. Like, I, that's just... I, I I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I think something kinks also, are going to get worked out. Cannot, everyone talks about that Kyler two point conversion. The defense that's in, that's in, so embarrassing to allow that Kyler two point conversion. That's bad. That's bad. We stop right. that they win that game. So the Raiders, Matt, you're saying their your their record indicates how bad they are. Like yes. their record is an indication of their team. Except I, I'm, I'm, they're they're a one and two team because I think they're gonna be like seven and ten or six and eleven. They're not like one of the worst team. They're the worst team in the league right now, record wise. I don't think they're the worst team in the league, but they're, they're bad. Like I thought they'd be. Jake, are they this bad? No, they're not this bad. I think that they will hopefully eventually gain some rapport. I think that's a lot of what it is. It's a lot of like. Okay, I know Devontae Adams pretty well. Let me force this ball in here because he's also the best team player on the team. Um, and ultimately that's not going to be a super winning formula. So uh, I think maybe I, I thought they would be much better than this, but they're not Owen three bad, um, but they might not have the playoff aspirations that we thought. 
Here's where I'll settle. They're not playing to nearly what I thought they were, but I still think they're going to finish higher than the Chargers, maybe even the Broncos. I'm, well, depending on how Herbert, like that's a, that's like legit. Because Herbert, possible. if they keep playing Herbert when he can't move, like they're not going to play a lot of games. They should sit him now. They, right, they, they need to sit Herbert now. for like four weeks and just eat All it. All right. We're going to move on from a team-focused segment to a player-focused segment. Play a little straight facts, hold them. I like this. We haven't done this in a while. Little hold the stats or fold the stats. So I'm going to give you something, a trend of stats that's going on in the NFL right now, and then you're going to tell me whether you're going to hold them. These stats are going to continue or you're going to fold them. These stats will not continue or this trend will not continue. First one we're going to do is we got to talk about that brother Lamar Jackson. And before I, before I even get into it, the Ravens got some nerve, don't they? No, the Ravens got some audacity, don't they? What's funny like is it's truly they're only hurting. They they really did it to themselves, quite actually. Like they can't be mad at anyone but themselves, which is the best part here with the buffoonery. contract. Like 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 true truly buffoonery because Lamar Jackson, the price of the brick is going up literally by the week, tied for fourth and rushing and tied for first and passing odds. So Jake, hold them or fold those stats. He's going to continue to be top five in both as the season continues. Uh, I'm going to hold them. It's incredible. I I mean, obviously, like we've, we've talked about Lamar a ton here. You guys know how I feel um, about him overall, not just him, guys who are used um uh, you know, they're franchise quarterbacks who are used in a power run setting. I don't like that. Mm. Uh, that being said, there's been less of that this year, and a lot of his scrambling has, A, been really successful because he's killing from the pocket now, uh, and B, he's not putting himself in as many, like, disadvantageous. He's running around scrambling, doesn't know where, where guys are coming back across the grain to, to come after him. Like, if you can just evade pressure, scramble for a couple of yards or, or break an 80 yard touchdown, which he's done. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be in a pretty good spot and he leads the league in touchdown percentage, uh, 11.4% um, on the touchdown percentage, meaning one touchdown every 8.8 .8 pass attempts. That is hyper efficiency. That probably won't hold up, but even if it doesn't, they, they've looked That's like the old Ravens. Good. That's a touchdown a drive. You complete eight passes. That's a that's a drive, and it ends in a touchdown most of the time. Like that's that's incredible, and and, and that's that's what makes me so mad every time we talk about why Lamar Jackson deserves what he deserves. Because every crazy, not every crazy stat, but eighty percent of the crazy stats are passing stats. Like they're not. We're not rattling off all rushing stats for Lamar. Like I'll give you any passing stat you want. I give you yards. I give you completion percentage. I give you accuracy. I give you whatever passing stat you want. Like I give it to you. Like the brother is doing it all. Like I, I just, I don't understand. Like man, I don't know what I'm seeing. Hold yeah. or fold the stats. Uh, I hold him. I think he's probably the MVP favorite through three games, and I don't see that he's the most exciting show in football because. Every time he drops back to pass, he could produce a highlight in ways that no other player could produce a highlight, whether it's a scramble, whether it's evading a sack, whether it's a deep throw downfield, whether it's a pinpoint throw in the end zone. You never know what you're going to get with him. He, I, We definitely don't appreciate him not enough as NFL fans. We like to nitpick all the little flaws. Um, I'm not. I'm not calling you out, Jake. I, I just realized this kind of sounds like a Jake call out. Something. Something that I do. So no worries if you were. <laughs> um, like we need to. We need. There's so much BS hate that he gets because of like people, a lot of just Clay Travis types. Um, yeah. Not to name names, but I do. it's it's just and it's he's such a joy to watch, and he embodies that joy on the field. And I think it's going to continue to be great the rest of the way. And I think it's going to well, lead the, the Ravens to r maybe the Super Bowl. Here's here's why I really hold the stats. Two reasons. One, when you talk about running quarterbacks and mobile quarterbacks, the reason why it's you don't like it is because most of the time when they're running, they're putting themselves in situations where they're going to take big hits, where they're going to get hit a lot. 
And Lamar Jackson, the top three running quarterbacks in the league are him, Josh Allen, and Jalen Hurts. And of those three, he takes hits the least. Lamar don't take hits. Like, he's fast enough to get to the sideline and duck out of bounds. He's slippery enough to get around you to avoid a big collision. If you do tackle him, you're probably just wrapping up his ankles. Or he's smart enough to, if he needs to get down, I'm going to slide. But when you look at Josh Allen, Josh Allen runs between the tackles (laughs) and lowers his shoulders too big of a target. He takes hits. And Jalen Hurts gets himself into situations. I think he's not just not as fast enough to get out of situations. He takes a little bit of hits. He takes some hits sometimes. So I dispel it there. And what the Ravens did to Lamar and why I think all this is going to continue is now he's out to prove not only to the rest of the league, but he's out to prove it to the team who's not paying him, to the team who's not giving him that guaranteed money that he's seeing his peers get. So if I got to prove it to the organization to which jersey I wear, I got to run it up every time I get the ball. The like Ravens- I, I got to I gotta spaz, I got to go crazy because even my own, own organization needs to get, like needs to get, you know, woke it up a little bit. What's crazy about this is that the Ravens, because of their history, have this arrogance that they don't need to a great quarterback to win because Lamar is so much better than every quarterback they've had in their history. Trent Hill for one true. year, and then like old Steve McNair for a year, and then bad quarterbacks, and then Joe Flacco was like decent for like six years, and mm-hmm. and then they get Lamar Jackson, an MVP in his first full year starting, and doing like thousand back to back thousand yard seasons for a quarterback when in the history of the NFL that had only been done once ever, and it's just like uh, I don't know if we want to give him a contract extension. That's just, a good like, point. Yeah. It's That's just, a it's good horrible. point. Their most successful teams have come with sticky quarterbacks. That's true. Yeah, like well, they, are the hall, they are the hallmark franchise of win in spite of your quarterback. Like I they think they're, do it the most. They're, they're starting to find out. Uh, it, it may be more beneficial to have the great. It's easier to find once you've got them. It's easier to keep the great quarterback than to try and cobble together an elite defense every year. Hey, man, it's harder to keep the hot girl. So, you know, sometimes guys get a lot of girls, and then when they get the hot one, they don't know how to act. It's, Not when that girl was drafted to your team, and you had chances to <laughs> re-sign that girl for $250 million. Yeah, over. That's, but that's what I really don't understand because – and we could move on after this, but but this is, you're going to choose now to not take a chance on them? You took a chance on them with the last pick of the first round of the draft. You took a chance on them when you let them play over Joe Flacco. You took a chance on them in the playoffs. Hell – Every time that there's a fourth down and two, John Harbaugh takes a chance on him and allows him to go for it. And now, when it's time to give the brother security and lock him in long term so you can go win a championship, now is when you don't want to take a chance on him. Like, every other time. Every other time you were willing to do it. Except the time that makes the most sense. I mean, they're what they're hoping. they're, They're going to say we're willing to play it out because if he gets really badly hurt... He may never be the same player, and we're going to get him at a discount versus if he does really well, we probably win a Super Bowl, and sure, I'm happy paying him in, you know, more than he would have gotten if that is the case. Is yeah, but that's what happened. I, obviously, Lamar's much better than Flacco, but they got burned with Flacco yeah, that's true. because they let Flacco play off last year of his contract. Flacco goes on a historic playoff yep. run. They win the Super Bowl. I forgot about and that. They got to pay him. Way too much money. And if the Ravens' concerns with Fools. Lamar come true, say he wins the Super Bowl for this year and then he has a catastrophic injury and you have to pay him his contract bigger than it would have been if you signed him two months ago. Fools. Not often fools. we get to call Baltimore organization fools, but this is definitely not one true, of those times. Not true, because they normally do it right, but they're not right. doing it right this time. And I don't understand. All right, our next point we got to go into because we got to see if this trend is going to continue or not right now. Josh Allen is averaging a career low in yards per attempt or yards per carry for the quarterback. Jake, this is something you talk about a lot, not being high on the designed runs for Josh Allen. And through three games with Buffalo, even though he's playing well in overall sense, that stat that we know is so pivotal to his game is at a career low right now. So hold them or fold them. Is that going to continue for Josh Allen? Um, I think so. I'm going to hold that it's going to happen with Josh Allen, but I actually think this is probably a good thing. Um, because you know, as, as we just talked about, like when your quarterback is running like 
goal line, like, but and the, and the other team knows he's going to try and run. Um, that's kind of where we're at with Josh Allen. And I think that they've gotten away from that a little bit. I mean, we saw the three touchdowns to Stephon Diggs um, the other week. So the passing offense is working. That is what is, you know, a good thing. I believe Josh Allen leads the NFL in passing yards, if I'm not mistaken. But, he does. Um, <laughs> you know, that that's that's the plus side. The downside is, I think, the, the long-term wear and tear, or maybe it's not a specific injury, but – the hits that accumulate uh, and then the, the I guess, mental reactions that are built in from all those hits of I don't really want to take those big hits anymore has resulted in um, the other stat that, you know, highest in yards per carry before contact, lowest in yards after contact, meaning he's not necessarily blowing through people and, and you know, fighting for people, those extra yards, fighting for yeah. extra yards. He's not doing all of that anymore, which look, that's look. <laughs> if I'm a Buffalo fan, that's somewhat encouraging, honestly, um, because Josh Allen is good enough to win you uh, games late in the year. They only go through playoff runs while staying in the pocket. So while it's, it's not necessarily good for Josh Allen fantasy owners, I think it's good for, Josh Allen fans of the Buffalo Bills, uh, for sure. I think when they do design runs for Josh Allen, it means they're not in great situations in the game and they're pressing. So you look at the goal line stand that uh, Miami had against them last week where it was first and goal of the two, the first play, or second and goal from the one, and they do a Josh Allen designed run and he loses two yards and it sets up third and three, incomplete, incomplete, and the butt punt. And... It's the it's it's a doing those kinds of plays in those situations, and then you look at their record in close games since uh, week ten of twenty uh, twenty. I think it is they're one and eight in one possession games for a team that's won so many games. I think the play. I think it's a the play calling is poor in those situations for Josh Allen, and the stats reflect that. Yeah, they, and, they, and Jake, they, they should be doing a lot more of what Jake's suggesting. Right. And Jake, I like when you said the mental reactions from being in those situations, not only the not fighting for yards, but like the the keeping your quarterback in a quarterback mind frame. Like what I see with these design runs isn't so much X's and O's. It's the like kind of energy level and tenacity that you get from Josh Allen. But to me, it spills over into ways that you don't want to see it. Like him ripping Christian Wilkins' helmet off at the bottom of pile. Like any other player gets kicked out of the game for that. Any other player gets a penalty for that. But it's Josh Allen. He's a quarterback, so he gets protected. But like, I truly think when he gets in those rugby scrums like that, like he almost forgets he's the quarterback sometimes. Like, as the quarterback, you shouldn't be in those scenarios. As a quarterback, you shouldn't be looking at the weak side linebacker and thinking like, oh, I want to run him over on this play. That, that's not what you should be thinking. He thinks like a tight end when he's running with the ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and think about it. That boy is 6'3", 6'4", all of 215, 220. Like, he's never not been the biggest boy on the yard. He's never not been the biggest guy at whatever position, whatever game, whatever room he's in. He's never not been one of the biggest. So now is not when you're going to tell Josh Allen, MVP candidate, best quarterback in the league, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Now is not when you're going to tell him like, hey, it's not safe for you to run anymore. I, I don't think it's smart for him. He's like, what do, you, what do you mean? Like, I could run over him then. I can run over him now. Like, that's what he, that's like what he's thinking. And they got to save him from, him from himself. But the last stat I'll leave you guys with that we can move on to the, our last player is the Bills running backs have combined for the fourth fewest carries in the NFL. So do you think that this is a product of Josh Allen keeping the ball more, thinking he's got to shoulder the weight? Or do you think it's the inverse of Josh Allen keeping the ball too much and not sharing enough of the pie for his running backs, which they have three serviceable ones. So Matt, to you first. Oh, you said, I don't so, if you look at game by game, it's actually kind of interesting because week one against the Rams, he had 10 carries. Then week two against Tennessee, and they blew him out. Week two against Tennessee, they blow him out. He only has one carry. And then last week, he has eight carries. So it's clear that they're kind of trying different scenarios on how to use him. 
And like, other than the fact that Allen carried the ball eight times, but when you throw 63 times and then carry it eight times, that's 71 plays where you're in control of the outcome. And that, so at least against Miami, that was was kind of, they took the game away from the running backs completely, Mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, he's only, I mean, only 19 carries. I think it's, it's a, it's something he does out of necessity now. And again, they're, they're a very pass oriented offense. So I wouldn't read too much into uh, the running totals. I think as it gets colder, though, Devin Singletary's proven that he can be a guy that can be relied on um, as, as the weather gets colder and it becomes harder to throw the football. So I'm, I'm, hey, I'm still, I, after this loss, I'm still 10 toes down. Bills are winning the Super Bowl. Like, I'm, I'm confident. They just gotta. They just gotta not run the ball with their quarterback. Run the ball with their running backs. Well, you can run the ball with the quarterback when the other team doesn't know it's going to happen. When you line him up under center to get you one or two yards. I mean, like I guess QB sneaking has to happen. The issue is nah. when they do it from shotgun and he yeah, sprints into high, the middle of the pile. Like that's power high QB. Power yeah. high QB yeah. dive just doesn't <laughs> seem. It just doesn't seem like you know shot shotgun power high QB dive doesn't it's seem like something good. that should happen. I don't think they should continue to do that. Um, something that I do think can continue, and it's time for Stat Matt to face the music a little bit, is Saquon Barkley right now is averaging over 100 rushing yards per game. Came out the gate crazy in week one with a great rushing performance. Died a little bit down in week two, came back with another good rushing performance. In week three, the Giants are 2-1-1. and one, But Stat Matt, for a bottom-tier running back, this is pretty good. Hold the stats or fold the stats? What's going on? I'm folding the stats. Um, he's not going to keep this up. Uh, well, one, 6.0 is ridiculous. I think if you tell me the last two games and you average those out will be like his season, that makes a lot more sense. Like an 80 yarder and a 70 yarder and a touchdown. Like, so av- that would, it like averages out to like 1300 yards and like four and a half yards per carry, which is not what I predicted. With, uh, Which is that's way not... better than you predicted. Yeah, 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 yards yeah. Is way better than you predicted. Like a lot, of, he he seems to be boom and bust. I found a stat called success rate. I promise I wasn't looking for a stat to fit my argument. I stumbled across it, mm-hmm. uh, where he uh, is twenty six <laughs> in the NFL in success rate. Success rate is by Football Outsiders, the DVOA boys, um, and it basically means so they have it for defense, but for running backs, it's. A measure of running back consistency based on the percentage of carries where the player gets what he's supposed to get on each down. So if it's first and 10, he needs to get four yards to get a successful carry on first down. Stay ahead ahead of the sticks, right? Right. Yeah. So if it's second down, he needs 60% of the yards left on the down. And third and fourth down, he needs 100% of the yards. And right now he's sitting at, I think, 49.2% success rate, which, like, that could improve. Like, just like the other – he could – I'm willing to admit I'm probably wrong about bottom tier running back, but I still am going to fight about him him not being, like, a top – like, he's supposed to look like a middle-of-the-pack running back. That's still not good enough. Jake, you can go ahead and hold him or fold him, but that's still not good enough. So it's funny you mentioned success, right? He currently, this is per uh, NFL Next Gen stats, Saquon currently leads all running backs in rushing yards over expected, plus 114, and only trails Lamar Jackson, plus 151, uh, among all players. So, like, this, it's also going to, I think, skew more in Saquon's favor. Uh, the unfortunate Sterling Shepard injury means that there's going to be more targets going around in that offense. He's a guy who get, who is averaging five a game right now. Uh, I think if you bump it up to seven or eight, you're looking at, you know, the old Saquon kind of. In terms of usage, you're looking at the old Saquon. Um, so I think he's primed now for a pretty big season that they don't have a great offensive line from what I've seen. Um, and the quarterback doesn't seem to be able to make reads consistently. <laughs> so he, he'll he enjoy the check down in Saquon. I think he could be set up for, for some big stuff, so I'm going to hold him here. Yeah, averaging 100 rush yards per game is – that's a really good season. Yeah. Um, Like, you know what I mean? That that's, that puts you in – that you're you're in a top-tier running back if you're averaging 100 yards throughout well, the whole like, season. That's like, that's like a all first team all-pro level. Yeah, that's 1700. Yeah, that, so that's 1700 yeah, if you do 100. That, yeah. that is – that's – Really, really good if you're averaging 100 yards per rush game. 
Um, I don't think the Giants are going to be in a position for him to run the ball that often. Like they're like Matt said, they're a bad two or one football team. So to run the ball a lot, you got to have be in favorable positions in the game. Can't imagine that through the next fourteen weeks they're going to be in a favorable position through much of the game. They've played they've played well through three weeks, better than probably a lot of teams probably expected them to come out of the gate. But for Saquon to have that, the the volume and the circumstance has to be exactly right. But I love it from the standpoint of Saquon looks like to me. Maybe with a little less burst, the old Saquon. Yep. I'm talking about the non the non hesitancy when he gets the ball, the one cut go north and south, the crazy jump cuts within the hole. I mean, uh, against the Titans, that two point conversion that he had is all Saquon. That's a, that's supposed to be blown up. That he makes the great jump cut and then runs somebody over to get the two point conversion. It, so that that kind of stuff is like, my God, that's the old Saquon. That is what made him top tier running back in the league. So I will hold on to the fact that good Saquon is back, but I will fold the hundred rush yards per game because he would probably be the leading rusher in the NFL at the end of the season. If he did that, I, I don't see it going that high, but no, we'll see bottom tier running back. will just forever be crazy, but we're almost out of time for this episode of straight facts. It was a great one. As always, we can get some shots up at the buzzer. Someone got something to say at the, buzz- at the buzzer. I got a weird hot take. Butts oh, aren't that funny. Butts are not. They're they're kind of funny. They're chuckle funny. People making a big deal about a butt punt is like oh, bizarre okay. to me. If it hit his leg, glad, it would be just I'm as funny. I'm glad you if went it, somewhere. If, if it hit his back, it would have been just. It would have been like a little less funny. Like the fact that it hit his butt doesn't make it funny. It's the fact that he hit his own guy. The Mark Sanchez butt fumble was not funny. It, was, it makes it a little bit more funny that he ran to the guy's butt, but he ran to his own. But the f- dumbness of the play is that he ran to his own guy and fumbled. Butts are like a little, like, like little, like sprinkles on top of the ice cream for the funny part. It's like, like it, 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 it like is, bumps it up like a little bit. It's like it's, it's like ooh, I like that. But like, like it, they, people make it like the the volume of the hilarity. And it's not like butts are just, it's like kind of funny, but it's like people are acting like, oh, this is a picture. We got the ball from the butt punt. And it's just like, like it was like, what, where it's real. It's, we're not, I, I just, I'm just, I just don't get it. It's like, yeah, it's, man, he punted it off his butt. That's pretty funny. I don't know about <laughs> you. Know, like, oh, man, that's that's right. the whole reason it's funny. That's the whole reason it's funny. If he punted it off his helmet, it would be a little funny. But the but the freeze frame of the ball hitting his ass mid vibration is just that that's is funny. that's funny. The vibration like, is like, makes I agree like with that. The NFL, when the NFL said it's just the greatest <laughs> picture of all time, like, like I I commented like it really might be like this really might be the greatest picture of all time. That joint is hilarious, Matt, <laughs> and it has everything to do with the fact that it was off his ass. Everything, <laughs> everything. I'm sorry, I hear what you're saying, but everything. Um, so I've got a, a pretty sad one this week. Uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the, uh, parents and families affected by the, uh, so Roxborough high school. There was a uh, yes, mass bro, shooting yes. there, uh, yesterday, five people shot after a football game. So that's like 900 feet away from my house. Uh, so it, it's, you know, gun violence, especially in the big city is just out of control right now. Um, so really my heart does go out to, to those affected. It's, it's a terrible, terrible thing, uh, especially in this community, which, you know, for, for, I've only been here for like a year and a half, very quiet. So, uh, just very, very unfortunate event that happened yeah. and thoughts to those affected. Yeah, bro. I mean, I, I heard the other day that Philly is in a state of emergency when it, in terms of gun violence, top 10 in the country and, um, I believe in, in homicide rate right now. So it's, it's really scary. It's ugly out there. Stay safe where you are, bro. Like you, you just kind of detailed how close you are to the madness. Yeah. So make sure you stay safe, but um, that's a good sentiment. Thoughts and prayers, man. Some, some, something, something's got to get better. Yeah. Some definitely has to get better. Um, I'll continue with the thoughts and prayers sentiment. Thoughts and prayers to everyone down in Florida right now who are, currently dealing with the effects of uh hurricane ian and the in the her the ensuing hurricanes afterwards that's uh something that us in here in the northeast have the privilege of never having to deal with is every year 
this time of the year, you get hit with back to back to back to back crazy storms. Um, Jake, you and I both know people who stay down there in terms of our other job. So Casey Hudson, Kelly Mizell, thoughts with you and your family. Hope you guys are safe and everything and doing what you can. Um, but a little brevity in it, Kaylee and I were talking before the last Jolly Rogers and Touchdown uh, episode. And I asked her, like, how crazy it is it that you guys go through this every year? Like, ev- like every year around this time, you know your house might get uprooted from a storm. Like, how does that make you feel? And she was like, the rest of the country kind of overpaints it. Like, she was like, you guys get, you have to prepare for crazy snowstorms every year. Like, you know, that's kind of how we feel about it. Like, we know we're going to get bad hurricanes, but you guys know you're going to get a nor'easter or two. Mm. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not afraid that, like, my house is going to yeah. get ripped out of the ground or that my street's going to be, you know, 10 feet deep of water and my car's going to go That's what scares me, dude. I've seen some you know what I mean? terrifying scenes already from for the, You know what I mean? So... Well, I understand her sentiment, and maybe it's something you get a little desensitized to once you learn how to batten down the hatches a little bit better. But from from the people who don't experience it, that zone looks scary. So everyone down there, just please um, be as safe as possible. But that's all the time we have for this episode of Straight Facts. It was a great run. Shout out to everybody on the Up On Game Presents Network, LeVar, LeVar Arrington, TJ Hushmanzada and Plexico Burst. Make sure you guys are liking, following, and subscribing to them wherever you get your podcast. And of course, iHeartMedia. So you can see us, man. My guys, Jake Galley and Stadman Robinson. I'm James Jackson. These have been the facts. Straight up. <laughs>